Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Today's episode is about sexual assault, so I would like to emphasize listener discretion. If you find this topic distressing, you may want to skip this episode. April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. I wanted to cover a case that highlights rape culture on college campuses, particularly in athletics. On the evening of June 22, 2013, a 21-year-old senior at Vanderbilt University met a new football recruit for drinks at the Tin Roof Bar in Nashville. Michelle, a pseudonym I'm going to use for the victim in this case, was meeting a guy she'd already had a few dates with. 19 years old and 6 foot 6 inches tall, Brandon Vandenberg had recently transferred from a college in California. He was the nation's number one junior college tight end. He hadn't played one game yet at Vandy, but he was already living in the dorms and was making friends. He brought Michelle a drink he called a California Long Island Tea. She said after a few sips of the blue drink, she doesn't remember anything else from that night. Instead of memories, Michelle was assaulted with photographs and videos of her gang rape recorded on cell phones by her attackers. Metro Nashville police had to show her these horrific images to get her to cooperate because Michelle had sadly believed her attacker's account of the night before, a man she considered her new boyfriend, and she had denied the charges at first. Michelle was originally prepared to stand up for these football players and clear their names, but the photos and videos on those phones would forever change her life. She was traumatized, but determined to make sure she received justice, testifying in four trials and fighting the media to protect her privacy. Welcome to Episode 50, The Vanderbilt Rape Case. Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, is often referred to as the Harvard of the South. I've covered the history of Music City extensively in other episodes, but it's important to discuss the role of Vanderbilt University to Nashville. Cornelius Vanderbilt gave a million-dollar endowment to form Vanderbilt University in 1873. Known as the Commodore, he was a shipping and railroad magnate from New York City. He was talked into the philanthropic gift by the husband of his wife's cousin, Methodist Bishop Holland N. McTeary of Nashville. McTeary had come to New York for medical treatment and convalesced at the Vanderbilt home, gaining the admiration of Cornelius Vanderbilt and the support for his idea of a university in the South that would, quote, contribute to strengthening the ties which should exist between all sections of our common country. McTeary oversaw construction of the university, even personally planting the many majestic trees the beautiful Vanderbilt campus is famous for. The university's brick buildings sit in the southwestern corner of the city, not far from Music Row. Though initially under the patronage of the Methodist Episcopal Church South, the university parted ways with the church in 1914. Today, it is known as a top research university. Privately funded, Vanderbilt ranks in the top 15 schools in the country. Vanderbilt University Medical Center, a nonprofit hospital, separated from the university in 2016 but both have a tremendous effect on the local economy, employing over 21,000 people between them. Vanderbilt University has a little under 7,000 students in undergraduate programs and 6,000 more in graduate studies. However, it's not really known as a football college, even though it is the only private school in the SEC or Southeastern Conference. Vanderbilt is considered a small school with a small stadium in a city overshadowed by the NFL's Tennessee Titans and the NHL's Nashville Predators. In 2010, Vanderbilt hired head coach James Franklin from the University of Maryland. He had a reputation as a first-rate recruiter and had coached many players into the NFL. Players during Franklin's time characterized him as a great motivator who changed the culture of defeatism in the football program. He demanded and expected success. He built close relationships between coaches and athletes, and more importantly, successfully engaged the student body to rally behind Vandy football. The Commodores were underdogs, and Coach Franklin wanted to change that. He would spend hours walking campus, high-fiving students, and he coined the rallying phrase, anchor down, for his team. 
By 2011, the Commodores made it to a bowl game. In Franklin's second season, Vanderbilt finished in the top 25, which resulted in a sold-out opening game in 2013. He had turned the tide, but it came just two months after four of his players became involved in the scandal known as the Vanderbilt rape case in the press. Though James Franklin has always denied any wrongdoing, he did initiate an informal hostess program for new recruits for the team. Michelle, the victim in the case, worked for the athletic department and was on the Vandy dance team. He asked her to find about 15 pretty girls to form a team to help with recruiting. Both Franklin and the university have adamantly denied any hostess program, insisting they adhere to NCAA policies governing prospective student-athletes. But I choose to believe Michelle. Because once word got out about the attack, Coach James Franklin and the Commodore's Director of Performance Enhancement, Dwight Galt, called Michelle and told her they cared about her because she assisted them with recruiting. Furthermore, on the night she was attacked, she and Vandenberg were drinking at the Tin Roof on a tab opened up by a booster named Angela Gentry. As a top donor for the Vanderbilt football program, she kept an open tab for players and was known to occasionally buy the girls' drinks as well. This is another NCAA violation. And it was at the Tin Roof that Brandon Vandenberg gave Michelle a blue drink, and after a few sips, she remembers nothing else from that night. I'm going to pause now for a quick commercial break. When Michelle went and met Vandenberg close to midnight at the Tin Roof, she was excited. They had already been on a few dates. She considered him her new boyfriend. They threw back two shots of fireball whiskey. She had a gin and tonic, and then Vandenberg brought her the blue drink, something he called a California Long Island tea. 19-year-old Brandon Vandenberg had recently transferred from the College of the Desert, a community college in Riverside, California. He was a top recruit, like I said in the opening. According to ESPN, he was the nation's number one junior college tight end. He was six foot six inches tall and 260 pounds. On social media, he touted himself as an honor student with aspirations to the NFL. Praise God, he says with an exclamation point, and then hashtag I am second, hashtag God first. Michelle was 21 years old, a neuroscience and economics major who was on the dance team and worked for the athletic department. This wasn't her first rodeo having drinks at the tin roof. She knew how it worked, and she had even dated another player before. But this was the first time she blacked out from a drink at the bar. We learn later from testimony that the two shared a cab back to Michelle's apartment. Vandenberg claims she was sexually aggressive in the cab, grabbing his crotch and telling him that she was wet and couldn't wait to have sex with him. Of course, we only have his word for that. But even if that's true, she did not consent to what happened next. When they got to the apartment, she couldn't get her key to work and neither could he. So instead, they got into her black Mercedes with Vandenberg driving. She had lost one of her black heels at the apartment, which her roommate found the next morning. By the time Vandenberg pulled up to the Gillette dorm at Vanderbilt, Michelle was unconscious in the passenger seat. Security footage shows Vandenberg getting out of the car to go scan his card to get into the building. At trial, it came out that there should have been a proctor on duty at the door that evening. But there was no one there. If there had been, this horrific case might have been stopped right here. Instead, you see three other men walk up. Corey Beatty, Brandon E. Banks, and Jaborian Tip McKenzie were coming back from a late-night run for Mexican food. It was 2.30 a.m. McKenzie was 18 years old, and the other two were 19. All three were African-American, red-shirted players. Vandenberg and Michelle are both white. Redshirting, for any non-Americans or non-football lovers, is basically a player who is allowed to practice with the team and dress out, but they're not allowed to play. It saves them a year of eligibility and can extend their time at college, making them a fifth-year senior. 
Corey Beatty was the youngest son of 13 children, and his mother had worked for Vanderbilt Hospital for over 30 years. Jaborian McKenzie came from Woodville, Mississippi. He had transferred from Trinity Episcopal in Natchez, Mississippi. Brandon Banks came from a family of football players, growing up right outside of Washington, D.C. Though Corey Beatty would be seen as a ringleader in this gang rape, Brandon Banks has a connection to Jameis Winston, famed rapist from FSU who went on to the NFL with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and kept assaulting women. The documentary The Hunting Ground about college campus rapes features his story. Brandon Banks was with him in 2017 while he was awaiting his own rape trial when Winston was accused of groping an Uber driver. I've seen and heard many people refer to these young men as kids. I submit that they are old enough to vote, go to war, and even be put to death in my state. But they were still underage drinkers. And despite its prestige, Vanderbilt University has a party culture just like most American colleges. On the night of June 22, 2013, Beatty, Banks, and McKenzie had spent the night in one of their dorm rooms doing shots of Honey Jack Daniels, among other drinks. When Vandenberg summoned the men over to Michelle's car, they can be seen laughing, and then they help him carry the unconscious girl into the dormitory. Security footage from cameras inside the dorm show the men dumping Michelle into the floor outside of Vandenberg's room. There, her skirt rode up, and they're already taking pictures of her on their cell phones. At least four other athletes saw the unconscious young woman lying in the hallway, with her buttocks exposed, but walked by, ignoring the situation. Not long after this, the men can be seen taking Michelle into Gillette dorm room number 213. About 30 minutes later, Vandenberg is seen coming back out of the room, now clad in red undershorts, with a towel over his head. He threw a towel over the security camera so the picture goes dark briefly before the towel falls off. So you can't tell me he wasn't aware that what they were doing was illegal and immoral. His attorneys would later blame alcohol and party culture for his behavior, but it's clear he knew it was wrong. I'm going to pause now to hear a word from our sponsors. In the wee hours of June 23, 2013, Vanderbilt wide receiver Chris Boyd received a text with a photo attached. It was of Michelle being sodomized with a water bottle. The text was from Brandon Vandenberg. Chris Boyd answered, Tell your boys to delete that shit. I'm looking out for your ass. And tell your roommate he didn't see anything. He needn't have worried about Vandenberg's roommate. Mac Prelo was more concerned with missing his beauty sleep. He saw Michelle face down on the tiled dorm room floor and heard what was going on, but got up to go sleep in another room without intervening. Vandenberg then texted photos and videos to a friend from his hometown in California named Miles Finley, who immediately answered back, quote, She can call that rape. Delete that shit. But then he followed up that text with one saying, Dog, kick that bitch out of the room or gangbang her. And then don't let her wake up. Vandenberg also texted these images and videos to a friend named Joey Quinzio, who immediately deleted them. But his phone was synced with his computer. Vandenberg had hashtagged these texts with penis problems, because evidently he was so drunk and coked up he couldn't achieve an erection. Vandenberg also asked Chris Boyd to come over to his dorm. Not long after, Boyd and a couple of other teammates were seen entering the dorm hallway on security footage. Dylan Vanderwall and DeAndre Woods were caught on camera coming into the dorm with Boyd. The security footage in the dorm did not capture what happened to Michelle while she was in Vandenberg's dorm room, but she was dumped back outside in the hallway, face down. When Chris Boyd arrived, he helped Vandenberg move Michelle from the hallway back to his room and onto his bed. Around 8 a.m., Michelle woke up, disoriented, and didn't know where she was. At first, she thought this was the worst hangover of her life. 
but later, when she got home, she realized she was sore all over. This wasn't like a night of hard drinking. Her right shoulder and right wrist ached. Her right knee had a bloody gash. Her hair was wet and smelled strange. She was bruised everywhere from her face to legs and buttocks. She was nauseated, confused, and very ashamed. She got herself home and soon got a text from her chivalrous date from that evening, Brandon Vandenberg, who shamed her. He told her she got wasted and threw up in his dorm room and that he had to clean up the mess and take care of her all night. She felt terrible and agreed to meet him later that day. Vandenberg initiated sex and she complied, saying in court it only lasted a few seconds. Prosecutors would later argue that Vandenberg was trying to cover up physical evidence that might be found in a rape kit. She later said that she was so embarrassed and apologized profusely. She truly believed that Vandenberg was her new boyfriend and that he had taken care of her that night. You can only imagine the horror and betrayal when she found out he orchestrated her gang rape. Meanwhile, Chris Boyd was keeping his girlfriend updated with the incident. He texted her, I got everything cleared up and I talked to both Tip and Corey already. Deleted everything. She didn't remember shit and feels bad. Chris Boyd may not have taken part in the rape, but he's no less a piece of shit in my eyes. Even though neither Vanderbilt Campus Police nor Metro Nashville had been called, somehow, the next day, the athletic director David Williams knew and called Coach James Franklin, who is vacationing in Florida. Franklin immediately flew home to help with damage control. That same day, Vandenberg, Beatty, Banks, and McKenzie met at a Popeye's chicken restaurant to get their stories straight. On June 25th, Vanderbilt Maintenance reported a vandalism at the Gillette dorm to campus police. Someone had thrown or hit a door in the dorm, splitting it down the middle. Campus police went all over the security footage from that weekend and were stunned to see the football players carrying the unconscious woman into the dorm. After sitting on it for a day and contacting all university officials, they finally called Metro Nashville Police. Sex crimes detective Jason Mayo contacted Michelle, who adamantly denied being raped. She insisted that she had passed out drunk in her boyfriend's dorm room and nothing had happened. They showed her the video of her so-called boyfriend and the other players bringing her into the dorm and dumping her unconscious body on the floor. At this, she finally agreed to a medical exam and rape kit. But it had been over 72 hours, and she'd had consensual sex with Vandenberg since then. His semen was found on the rape kit, but that was now easily explained. And it was too late for a blood test to determine if she had been drugged that night. Michelle has always insisted that she had never blacked out like that before. She hadn't even been drinking long that night. They met at the tin roof at midnight and were back at her apartment a little after 2 a.m. She remembered taking a couple of shots and drinking a gin and tonic before Brandon Vandenberg handed her the blue California Long Island tea. After a few sips of the blue drink, she couldn't remember anything else. It's very possible he slipped her a date rape drug but now it was too late to prove it. The next day, Coach James Franklin and the Director of Performance Enhancement called her to see how she was doing. This is the conversation where they say they care about her because she helped with recruitment. At this point, Michelle was more embarrassed than horrified by what she had seen on the security footage because she hadn't seen the worst of it yet. All she had seen were the men carrying her passed out. She still was not sure she was actually raped, despite consenting to going for a rape kit exam. Later that day, she texted Vandenberg, quote, Are you okay? I'm worried. He responded, No, I'm not. This is all so messed up. I didn't do anything, and I feel like I'm getting blamed for stuff that didn't happen. I just want to cry. Me and a bunch of my teammates are probably going to get kicked off the team unless something changes. Michelle answered, I don't want to get anyone in trouble because of me. I'll do everything I can to clear your name. But despite Vandenberg's attempts to destroy evidence, Detective Jason Mayo had already brought in Metro Digital Forensic Investigator Chad Gish. 
search warrants were issued, and phones were seized. Brandon Vandenberg had even flown to California to personally ensure that the photos and videos he sent to his old friends were deleted. And a search history on his phone showed that he had Googled to find out if the police could retrieve a deleted photograph. Yes, they can. The larger pictures, once deleted, turn into thumbnail files still on the phone. Detective Chad Gish found seven thumbnail images on Corey Beatty's phone, nine on Vandenberg's, and 14 on Brandon Banks. None were found on Jaborian McKenzie's phone. On August 9, 2013, Vandenberg, Beatty, Banks, and McKenzie were all indicted with five counts of aggravated rape and two counts of aggravated sexual battery. By August 16th, 21-year-old Chris Boyd, the senior wide receiver Vandenberg had texted the night of, who was trying to cover for his boys, was also indicted, along with Vandenberg's two friends from California, Miles Finley and Joseph Quinzio. They were all indicted for felony tampering with evidence, with Boyd receiving an additional charge of accessory after the fact. Vandenberg had actually dumped Finley's phone in a lake when he flew out to California, and Quinzio told police his phone had been stolen. But as I said, Quinzio's phone was synced automatically to his computer, which the police seized. Now they had all of the videos. Michelle was finally shown all the images and the videos. She was horrified, devastated, and traumatized by an attack she couldn't even remember. As she scrolled through, she saw an image that she said she first thought was a dead woman's face. Quote, I was suddenly overwhelmed by a memory of a family member's corpse. And then I realized, that's me. They had taken a picture of my face during the rape. And now Michelle faced multiple trials for her rapists, where she would have to identify herself in those images over and over again. In October of 2013, the district attorney announced that the cases of Brandon E. Banks and Jaborian McKenzie would be separated from Brandon Vandenberg and Corey Beatty's, meaning there would be two trials. This was probably because Banks and McKenzie were both expected to testify against their friends in hopes of a plea deal. And while they were out on bail awaiting trial, Banks and McKenzie had quietly transferred to other schools to continue playing ball. In September of 2013, the Nashville Post reported that McKenzie was playing at Alcorn State in Mississippi. He was dismissed from the team the day after the press found out. Brandon E. Banks traveled around to colleges actually speaking about sexual violence. Word got out once he was scheduled to speak at LSU, and the rest of his speaking engagements were canceled. He was also playing ball for Butte College in California, but was also dismissed from the team once the media found out. The first trial for Brandon Vandenberg and Corey Beatty began January 12, 2015. And though Judge Monty Watkins forbid anyone but the jurors and court officers from seeing the photographs and videos, the details became public as Detective Chad Gish explained what the images were and then the victim Michelle testified, confirming that each image was of her. In the first video, Brandon Vandenberg took out a box of condoms and handed them around. Corey Beatty took off his jeans. Vandenberg could be heard saying, You're not even hard, bro. Beatty then pulled Michelle's clothes off and penetrated her with his fingers. As he was doing this, Brandon Banks was taking up-close pictures of her vagina as he also groped her. Michelle described it as, quote, image after image of my genitalia covering the entire frame of screen with these stark, alien-looking fingers all over my flesh moving frame to frame with multiple hands reaching in. And then Brandon Banks inserted a water bottle in Michelle's anus. And Brandon Vandenberg can be heard on video cheering him on, saying, Squeeze that shit! Squeeze that shit! After this, it appears from the video that Corey Beatty raped Michelle vaginally even though supposedly he did not have an erection. Vandenberg is heard in the background of these videos laughing hysterically, but he was also attempting to masturbate as he looked at porn. He was trying to achieve an erection himself, but was reportedly too drunk and high on cocaine. Then both Vandenberg and Beatty are seen slapping Michelle in the face, 
trying to see if she would wake up. The young woman didn't move. She was comatose. Corey Beatty is then seen in a photograph with his penis in her mouth. He then moved and rubbed his buttocks on her face. Then he sat there on her, flipping a bird for the camera. When he stood up, he urinated on her face and hair and reportedly said, that's for 400 years of slavery, bitch. I hesitated to include this racist detail because prosecutors did choose to strike it from the official record. It is certainly inflammatory, but Michelle later refers to it in her victim impact statement, and as ugly and horrific as it is, it's important to tell the truth. After this, Michelle was put back outside in the hallway floor, face down. It was only after Vandenberg called Chris Boyd that he and another player named DeAndre Woods showed up that Michelle was moved out of the hallway and put back into Vandenberg's bed. Woods testified at trial that he did not help move Michelle and couldn't recall who helped Boyd move her back into the dorm room. Though he was definitely there that night, his image caught on security footage, the prosecution chose not to charge Woods with accessory after the fact. He did testify against his teammates, but I still don't understand this decision. He may not have been as culpable as Chris Boyd, but he was definitely part of the cover-up. Jaborian McKenzie, who was in the room during the gang rape, testified against his teammates. There was no photographic or video evidence that McKenzie ever touched Michelle. He said on the stand that he only took one photo with Banks' phone when he was asked. He claimed he wanted to leave the room, but Banks pulled him back in. And he confirmed every act seen on the videos and in pictures. He also told the court about the meeting he had with the other three men at Popeye's Chicken the next day. They had made a pact to stick together and cover up the rape. Vandenberg's roommate, Mac Priolo, testified that he was sleeping on the top bunk bed when the four men brought Michelle into the room. He said he heard their laughing and conversations, and then he heard pornography being played. He confirmed that Michelle was passed out on the floor, but that he chose to get up and go sleep in a friend's dorm room. Joseph Quinzio and Miles Finley also testified. Quinzio seemed genuine in his testimony. He said he was surprised and horrified when he got the text from Vandenberg and immediately deleted it. But Miles Finley is the disgusting cretin who texted Vandenberg back with instructions to kick that bitch out of the room or gangbanger. He was treated more like a hostile witness on the stand. The defense called Dr. James Walker to the stand to testify that Corey Beatty was significantly intoxicated and claimed he blacked out. This is ridiculous. There was no blood test performed on Beatty to prove this, and the prosecution brought a witness on the stand to refute the doctor's testimony. Corey Beatty had a girlfriend at the time of the assault, and her roommate testified that she went to Beatty's dorm room that night, and he seemed nonchalant and his speech was normal. Brandon Vandenberg and Corey Beatty both took the stand in their defense, but their attorneys took different stances. Beatty's attorney tried to blame the corrupt culture of American colleges, quote, a culture of sexual freedom, a culture of sexual experimentation, and a culture that encourages promiscuity. Beatty, shaking and crying, said he was drunk out of his mind, quote, this is nothing I would have ever done in my right mind. Vandenberg took the stand and blamed the victim, his date that night, a woman who considered him her boyfriend. He claimed she had consented to have sex with him and that she was the one who was sexually aggressive. But he was destroyed on cross-examination when prosecutor Tom Thurman asked about Michelle's consent. Vandenberg said yes, she did consent. Quote, Less than a half hour beforehand, less than 20 minutes beforehand, she told me she wanted to have sex all night long. It was very ambiguous as to who she wanted to have sex with. She just said she wanted to have sex all night long. That could mean any number of people. Anyone specifically, that's ambiguous. This tactic did not work any more than Beatty blaming alcohol. Defense attorneys for both men had already done the usual victim blaming when they cross-examined Michelle, asking her how much she had to drink if she took prescription medication that would have interacted with alcohol. They also grilled her on why she was hesitant to get a medical exam. 
but Michelle was a composed witness, explaining that she had no memory of the event and didn't know what had happened until she saw the images of herself. That's why she didn't go to the hospital or report the rape. In closing, Beatty's attorney focused on his supposed diminished capacity due to alcohol, and Corey Beatty's last-minute testimony and apology was touted, ironically, as a Hail Mary in the media. Vandenberg's attorney stressed repeatedly that he had not touched Michelle, that he was only culpable for inciting, encouraging, and failing to stop the rape. But the jury, who had looked appalled from the very beginning of the trial, was not moved by either defense. They found both men guilty on four counts of aggravated rape, one count of attempted aggravated rape, and two counts of aggravated battery. Vandenberg was also found guilty of tampering with evidence and unlawful photography. Brandon Vandenberg's father let out a scream when the verdict was read, and his astonishment that his son could be held responsible is indicative of toxic rape culture in our country. He truly believed that because his son didn't physically touch Michelle, he shouldn't be held responsible, despite the fact that she would not have even been in that room if it wasn't for his son, despite the fact that his son is heard on videos passing out condoms and cheering on his friends despite his son photographing and filming the assault and then sending these images to multiple friends. But the judge, Monte Watkins, disagreed. He sentenced Vandenberg to 17 years and Beatty to 15 years. But unfortunately for Michelle, this wasn't over. The defense attorney for Vandenberg, Fletcher Long, had discovered that the jury foreman had once been a victim of sexual assault and called for a mistrial. Prosecutors argued that the cases bore no resemblance. The juror was involved in a sexual relationship as a minor, and the charge was statutory rape. But it didn't matter. The juror had lied about his history, and in June of 2015, Judge Watkins declared a mistrial. This was devastating to the victim, who still faced testifying in the trials of Banks and McKenzie, and now she had to go through all of this again. On retrial... Corey Beatty's case was separated from Brandon Vandenberg's, a move that defense attorneys say put Beatty in a rushed position. But the trial moved forward on April 4, 2016, more than a year after the first trial. I think he had plenty of damn time to prepare. Beatty's pro bono attorney again put him on the stand, and he again apologized for his actions. But this four-day trial resulted in a different verdict. The jurors dropped the additional four aggravated rape charges to two counts of attempted aggravated rape, facilitation of aggravated rape, and aggravated sexual battery. Michelle was outraged by the verdict. She released a statement that read, Corey Beatty was guilty of each count of aggravated rape beyond a reasonable doubt last year, and he is no less guilty today. During her victim impact statement, she was even more passionate pleading with the court to give Beatty the full sentence. She said, quote, On June twenty second of 2013, I was a happy, hardworking Vanderbilt student looking forward to my future. I was 21 years old. I've seen with my own eyes what I was when Mr. Beatty was done with me. A piece of trash, face down in a hallway, covered in his urine and palm prints. She went on to say, quote, I am asking that Mr. Beatty receive the maximum of 25 years under the law to set the amount of time that he will not be able to do this to another victim, to deter others like him, and based on the particularly egregious nature of the rape itself, he did not just commit one act of violence against me. There were five acts of sexual assault and rape committed by him and him alone, and there were seven acts of violence that he was found guilty of committing against me. But my sexual assault is not where the attack ended. Mr. Beatty continued to abuse and degrade me, urinating on my face while uttering horrific racial hate speech that suggested I deserved what I was doing to me because of the color of my skin. He didn't even know who I was. I also ask for the maximum sentence of 25 years, as is appropriate for the impact this had and will continue to have on me every day for the rest of my life. But in May of 2016, Corey Beatty was again sentenced to the minimum of 15 years. Vandenberg went back on trial in June of 2016, and he was convicted on the same counts he was in the first trial. 
He spoke at his own sentencing that July, this time going for a more remorseful stance, while still basically blaming alcohol for his actions. Vandenberg said he was saddened, scared, ashamed, remorseful, and that he was deeply sorry. Quote, It seems inadequate to try to explain how all of this happened. I go over and over in my mind and try and replay what could have been done to prevent the events of that night. I am ashamed of myself and I was so irresponsible with alcohol, which led to something tragic. I had worked hard for so many years to reach my goal of getting a scholarship and playing in the SEC, going to Vanderbilt and getting a world-class education. My life and the lives of all of those around me, including Michelle's, seemed to be a dream at the time. I was living out my dream, and in an instant, it all changed. It turned into something that spiraled out of control, and we're all living a nightmare I don't wish anyone to go through. Michelle, though, had finally had enough. She had testified now four times, having testified first at Beatty and Vandenberg's combined trial, then in both of their retrials, and finally at Brandon E. Banks' trial, which had just wrapped up a week before. She said she could not bear to be there in court again after Beatty had received the minimum sentence. Instead, she issued a statement read by Assistant District Attorney Jan Norman. She said, Please do not use my absence as an excuse for leniency, as it in no way diminishes the profound and insidious impact of Mr. Vandenberg on me and my life. I still ask that he receive the full sentence allowed under the law for orchestrating the sustained 30-minute gang rape against me, a defenseless woman who trusted him. The minimum sentence is not enough for what this man did to me. But again, Brandon Vandenberg, the man who had started this whole nightmare, received the minimum sentence, 15 years for the rape, two additional years for tampering with evidence. Brandon E. Banks went on trial at the end of June in 2016, right on the hills of Vandenberg. His was the shortest trial, and he was the only defendant who did not take the stand in his own defense. There are whispers that he declined to testify due to his association with Jameis Winston, which would obviously be brought up on cross-examination and would damage his case. But he also turned down a plea deal with a 10-year sentence. His attorneys brought up a culture of peer pressure drinking to excess, and the other excuses used in the previous trials. But if it came out that he was with yet another football player in another state during another assault, this excuse of campus culture and peer pressure would seem even weaker. Had he learned nothing from his charges in Nashville? Jaborian McKenzie was the only one of the four men who received a plea deal in exchange for his testimony in their trials. In May of 2018, Almost five years after the attack, he was finally sentenced. He would serve no jail time, but he would have to register as a sex offender for the rest of his life and would be on probation for 10 years. Chris Boyd, the senior wide receiver who helped cover up the rape, did plead to misdemeanor charges of accessory after the fact, and he also received probation. It didn't immediately hurt his career. After Vanderbilt, he was drafted by the Dallas Cowboys, though his career did stall out not long after that. Vandenberg's friends from California, Miles Finley and Joseph Quinzio, received the same plea deal and probation that Boyd did for their testimony. This case has dominated headlines in Tennessee since news first broke of the gang rape. We are very much a football state. Vandy fans are not quite as dedicated as UT Vols fans, but still, they play in the SEC. In the South, college football is king. Many people watched with horror as their heroes went through these trials. Teammates even spoke to the press and went on social media in support of these players. Hashtags like Corey Beatty Strong dominated Twitter from players and fans alike. Where was the outcry of support for Michelle? Even throughout the trials, the defendants' side of the courtroom were filled with family and supporters. But Michelle usually sat alone with her mother, her lawyer, and a victim's advocate. This is one of the most heartbreaking issues of the case to me, and it's one of the reasons I decided to share every detail of her assault, including the racist words Beatty spoke to her. Because despite all of the graphic detail that came out in the press, public support swayed towards her attackers. Michelle was fighting battles on all fronts. 
I mentioned in my episode on the Wooded Rapist about how the Tennessean, along with a media coalition, had sued Metro Nashville over sealed files in this case because they had been denied access that was typically available under public records laws. They included Vanderbilt University in the lawsuit. Just days after the lawsuit was filed, Republican Senator Becky Duncan Massey sponsored a bill proposing a rape shield law. The Tennessean, along with other publications, said the bill was introduced in retaliation to the lawsuit, although legislators insisted it had been in the works for years. The media had been trying to get access of the security footage from the dorm, as well as all of the text messages. The media coalition claimed that this new rape shield law was not necessary because, as a rule, they did not name victims of sexual assault. Michelle and several victims' rights advocate agencies released statements in support of the bill, and the Tennessee Supreme Court agreed in a 4-1 to decision, and the bill was passed into law. I will never disagree with a rape shield law. As I said in my previous episode on The Wooded Rapist, as a researcher, easier access to records, quite obviously, makes my job easier. But I don't want that access at the expense of the victim or the integrity of a trial. And a major point of this law is not just to protect the victim's identity, but so that the details of the case are not made public before trial, potentially tainting the jury pool. The lawsuit was filed in February of 2014, before any of the trials. The Tennessean dropped their request for video footage, but still wanted access to the text messages. Those messages were extremely damning evidence in the cases, and the public did not need access to that before the trial. Personally, I don't cover cases until they have gone through the justice system, so this doesn't affect my job as much as it does a journalist. I get that. But with gavel-to-gavel coverage, they get their information as it becomes a matter of court record. Releasing key evidence to the public before trial is irresponsible. Ironically, as the Tennessean had dropped their request for the video footage, someone leaked it to ABC. It appeared on a 2020 segment called Reversal of Fortune on June 26, 2015, just three days after the mistrial was declared for Vandenberg and Beatty. Lawyers on every side released statements vehemently denying releasing those videos. Except one. Fletcher Long, Brandon Vandenberg's attorney. He said no comment. You may remember his name from previous cases. He represented the wooded rapist in appeals, and he also represented Perry March's father, Arthur. He used to be a big player in Tennessee courts, a very sought-after lawyer whose courtroom theatrics are legendary. And it's worth noting, he was disbarred twice. The first time in 2015, after a felony conviction of extortion. He and another attorney named Carrie Gassaway were sued after a woman who had hired them to attend the reading of her father's will in October 2010 said they took retainers before the reading and then kept insisting on further payments. They both willingly surrendered their licenses and were sentenced to two years in prison, which was suspended to four years of probation. And Fletcher Long, after gaining his license back, was again disbarred in 2017 for fraud. He was ordered to pay restitution to four former clients for conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, and misrepresentation. However, Fletcher Long always lands on his feet. He wrote a book on his long career and even hosts a radio show in Kentucky. But I think being disbarred twice shows the sort of ethics he exercised. But you have to wonder, if he was the one who leaked the Vanderbilt videos to ABC, why? The only reason I can think is that he represented the interests of Brandon Vandenberg only. And the security footage showed all four men in the case carrying the unconscious woman into the dorm, dumping her in the hallway, and taking pictures of her when her skirt rode up and she was exposed. I suppose he believed it mitigated his client's role as the instigator of the attack. But to be clear, we have no proof that Fletcher Long was the one that released the videos. ABC is not giving up their source. And whether or not this had any bearing on the retrials or in Banks' trial is debatable. The details of the attack and every man's involvement had already come out in Vandenberg and Beatty's first trial. But seeing those men dragging Michelle so callously is a powerful visual. Fletcher Long knew that. This case had implications for Tennessee state law, but also for Vanderbilt and other universities. 
In October of 2013, former student Sarah O'Brien first wrote a piece in the Huffington Post about her sexual assault at Vanderbilt and the university's failure to support her and other victims. She references Michelle's case in the piece. The next month, she and six other women filed a formal complaint with the Office of Civil Rights against the university, claiming the school had violated their civil rights under Title IX by failing to adequately respond to their complaints of sexual assault. To their credit, finally, Vanderbilt listened. They ordered a new Center for Victims Advocacy and a new service called Project SAFE that educates students on bystander intervention. The Vanderbilt case has often been compared to the Stanford rapist Brock Turner's case. There are two large differences, though. Number one, two bystanders saw Turner assaulting the woman and stopped him and held him until police arrived. There were at least four bystanders who saw Michelle lying unconscious and half-naked in a dorm hallway, but walked by, doing nothing. Number two, Brock Turner was sentenced to a paltry six months in jail, only three of which he actually served. And he did have to register as a sex offender, but the outrage of his sentence reverberated nationwide, and Judge Aaron Persky, who gave him such a light sentence, was voted out of his position in a recall campaign by California voters in June of 2018. It is cold comfort to the victim in that case, as her rapist is now a free man, but the reaction to Persky's decision is a step forward. In contrast, the Vanderbilt rapists were given harsher sentences. It could be for any number of reasons, including the graphic pictures and video, the nature of gang rape, and even the racial overtones of the case. White privilege was certainly blamed for the lighter sentence in Brock Turner's case. I think the key in both of these cases is the bystanders. In the Stanford case, two Swedish exchange students saw the assault and did the right thing. But four American athletes at one of the most prestigious colleges in the United States walked right by a helpless victim without intervening. Even if they were intimidated by the other athletes, they still should have dialed 911 once they got back to their own rooms. There is no excuse for their disgusting lack of empathy. Why is American campus rape culture so much more insidious? The ACLU estimates that 95% of campus rapes in the U.S. go unreported, and yet studies show one in five women will be a victim of sexual assault while in college. Research suggests that universities are largely responsible, often failing to investigate accusations or protecting the complaining student. Title IX is a federal civil rights law in the United States that was passed as part of the Education Amendments of 1972. By the 1990s, sexual harassment and sexual violence clauses were added. Quote, The sexual harassment of students, including sexual violence, interferes with a student's right to achieve an education free from discrimination. The additional clauses seem like a no-brainer, and yet campus rape was such a huge problem that it needed to be added and yet it still isn't very enforced. Colleges hold federally mandated instructional programs yearly, and university employees are taught how to help, when they can help, and what their legal responsibility is. And therein lies the tricky part, how and when they can intervene. There are many loopholes for university administrations to get out of their responsibility to their students. Over and over again, we hear these stories of students who were not listened to, whose stalkers or rapists were not even suspended from classes, much less expelled. Often, the victims have to change schools when the university fails to investigate and turn over the prosecution to the authorities, because otherwise, they still would have to attend classes with and see their attackers. And there are many schools who have been investigated for underreporting campus rape statistics to avoid Title IX sanctions. But Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos just made this even more difficult. This administration made changes to Obama-era guidelines that shift the determination of sexual assault from a preponderance of evidence to a clear and convincing evidence standard. This will hurt sexual assault complaints as rape rarely happens with witnesses and physical evidence isn't always reliable. Traumatized victims often wait to seek help until evidence is lost. Michelle is a very good example of a victim who didn't even know she was a victim. There was no physical evidence of her rape because she didn't know about it until she suffered the further degradation of seeing it on her attacker's cell phones. 
So why the hell are we going backwards? Especially now in the time of Me Too, when rape culture has finally come to the forefront in American minds. It's because the white male patriarchy claimed to be afraid of false allegations, including our president. But actual, academic, and clinical studies, not political rhetoric, show that less than 1% of rape accusations are false. Our culture just chooses to believe the man over the woman. We have two sitting Supreme Court justices with serious sexual harassment and rape allegations on their records. And their accusers willingly testified before the entire country, effectively ruining their lives. And it didn't stop these men from achieving the highest court in our land. But the sacrifices of those women do matter. More and more in our country, victims are trying to do their part. Michelle, the Vanderbilt gang rape victim, has shielded her identity, but she suffered through four trials, knowing that the details of her ordeal would be made public and would follow her for the rest of her life. But she has said in statements that it is worth it if it educates the public and changes how we view campus sexual assault. I feel like I preach every time I do one of these cases, but we must do better. We have to raise better men not only so they don't grow up to be violent or sexually offend, but also so that they are advocates and partners in this fight. That as bystanders, they stop and do the right thing. That as friends, they notice bad behavior in their friends and call it out. That as coworkers, family members, and friends, they believe us when we have the courage and strength to speak up. Many men in our country are evolved, and they are outspoken in their support and advocacy. They are our allies and should not be forgotten. As for the rest, I guess we just have to wait for the dinosaurs to die out and hope for a better, more culturally sensitive generation to follow. And I believe it will. Southern Fried True Crime is written and produced by me, Erica Kelly. The original graphic art is by Coley Horner, and Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. A great deal of my research on this case came from reporter Stacey Barchinger's coverage in The Tennessean. I also recommend the book Blurred Lines, Rethinking Sex, Power, and Consent on Campus by Vanessa Grigoridias. And there is also a Sports Illustrated long-form article by Jessica Luther on the case if you're interested in reading more. This was a tough case to cover, but it needs to be heard. We have to keep telling these stories if we want things to change. I have mentioned it a couple of times now, but as a reminder, I'm back at CrimeCon this year in New Orleans. I really hope some of you can make the trip. I'd love to meet you, and I'm looking forward to seeing familiar faces from last year. It's June 7th through the 9th, and if you're interested in going, please use my promo code to purchase your ticket. It's Fried Crime 19. Several of your favorite podcasters will also be in the Big Easy, along with speakers, exhibits, workshops, and everything CrimeCon has to offer. So again, to buy a ticket, don't forget to use my code FRIEDCRIME19. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm on most large platforms like Stitcher and other podcatchers. If you're interested in supporting the show, please visit my website, southernfriedtruecrime.com. There you can sign up to be a patron of the show, make a one-time donation, or purchase show merchandise. That's southernfriedtruecrime.com. If you have any comments, corrections, or suggestions, you can email me at southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I love hearing from you guys, and I'm always looking for new cases, so please feel free to reach out. I'm also all over social media. Just search the show name in your favorite platform. If you're interested in discussing this case or any other episodes further, come check out my discussion group. It's linked to my Southern Fried True Crime Facebook page. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.